and I'm happy to welcome you to this discussion about presidential impeachment. Our country has just endured several months of discussion and more process regarding uh, the impeachment of President uh, Trump. And President Trump is just the third president in our nation's history to have undergone such a process. And we have yet to see a president removed by this uh, process of impeachment, which was provided for in our Constitution. Today, I'm hoping you will help me welcome uh, Senator Sa uh, Chris Coons and our pro own Professor Sam Bray to discuss this uh, process. Senator Chris Coons has been serving as Delaware's junior member of the United States Senate since 2010. He currently holds uh, the seat once occupied by uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. Prior to serving in the Senate, he was county executive for Newcastle County, Delaware. Senator Coons received his undergraduate degree from Amherst College and earned a Truman Scholarship. And prior to entering Yale Law School and Yale Divinity School, Senator Coons wrote a book on the South African divestment movement and volunteered for the South African Council of Churches and as a relief worker in Kenya. Senator Coons clerked for Judge Jane Richard Roth of the Third Circuit and served as the in-house counsel for uh, the maker of Gore-Tex materials. Our own Professor Sam Bray joined the Notre Dame Law School faculty in 2018. His primary areas of research are remedies and equity, and his recent publications include uh, publications on ch uh, chancery law and uh, remedies, as well as uh, the book of Genesis. Sam, uh, Sam Bray is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, and he clerked for then Judge Michael McConnell, who later became my colleague at Stanford Law School. Um, after clerking, he practiced law for the law firm that I practiced for, Mayor Brown, and was an associate at Columbia uh, Law School. Was that an executive editor of the Constitutional, uh, executive director, I'm sorry, of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School, and an assistant professor of law at UCLA from 2016 to 2017. Please welcome Senator Chris Coons and Sam Bray. It's an honor to have you with us, Senator Coons. Um, I understand you, you recently had a bit of high profile uh, jury service. Indeed I did. Um, so um, let's start with a question about the Constitution. Uh, our Constitution is really old, and uh, the founding debates were a long time ago. Um, but do they matter? Why do they matter for how you think about what treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors mean? Well, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be with you, and um, I hope this will be engaging and informative. Um, a, a law school classmate of mine is actually the head of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Um, and as a true Constitution and, and framers and founders nerd, um, Jeff was just delighted with how much time we actually spent um, publicly, privately, during the impeachment trial, um, on the sides of it before and after, literally debating uh, among members about what does the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors mean? What does it mean that the framers gave to the Senate the sole power of impeachment? Is it the exclusive power? Is it the predominant power? Is it the sole power? What does it mean, if anything, that the framers were silent about standard of proof, about due process, about, I mean, I have a little pocket constitution in my desk on the floor of the Senate. And uh, one of the things that was amusing, amusing, I don't know, memorable to me, was the frequency with which one of my colleagues, left or right of me, would say, can I borrow your constitution? And I'd hand it over. Amy Klobuchar sits on this side, John Tester on this side. At one point, I literally looked down the row, and Todd Young, a senator from Indiana, I could see him doing this, and I thought, I know what he's doing. And I walked over and tapped him on the shoulder and handed him my constitution. And he smiled, and he flips through, and he, so, it was one of the very few times I have seen the entire Senate convened on the floor, actually looking at the original text, 
somewhat paying attention to argumentation pro and con about what these founding um, words meant, and then more importantly, deploying arguments about what, what is this structural role? Do you want me to keep riffing or do you want to ask no, this, any questions? This is great. I mean, I, this, is a, uh, this so, is the kind of thing we're talking about in constitutional law all the time is that the Constitution is not just for the courts. No. The Constitution is also for Congress and the president and the people. So, so one, of the, away. one of the things that was brought up repeatedly and debated repeatedly on cable TV, which some of you may have seen, I occasionally participate in to my own shame and embarrassment, um, and in actual deliberate conversations that were happening at night, in the morning, in the gym, in prayer breakfast, on the sidelines that you didn't see. Um, there's a basic question. In, in a parliament, you only remain the prime minister as long as you have the confidence of a functional majority. Um, the removal of the prime minister happens um, with a, a tempo and a dynamic that is fundamentally different than the structure that our founders imagined. Our founders imagined, and this is debated in the Federalist Papers, an executive who is elected at four-year intervals. So what does it mean to give to the Senate the power to remove that executive? And one argument was that um, what was being done now or what was done during the Clinton impeachment, and amusingly, this argument was advanced by almost exactly opposite members in right. opposite ways, depending on who, right? So watching film clips of Lindsey Graham speaking hypothetically, of course, or Jerry, Jerry Nadler, they made opposite arguments in the two impeachments. If you draw a through line between the midpoint of those, you've probably got a valuable insight, which is we should use this power rarely. We should not allow impeachment to be a removal tool when you no longer enjoy the support of a majority of the House and the Senate. It should be for some exceptional act. It should be for something that is structurally threatening and in particular, something that may weaken um, the fundamental power of removal through the next presidential election. I like this argument, of course, because it runs towards my conclusion. So in the Clinton impeachment, the argument was made, um, here's a president who has demonstrably committed a crime of perjury, but in a matter where its following consequences will not affect the next election. The argument in this fact pattern was, if true, the facts as alleged suggest the current president he is literally inviting foreign interference in our next election against his most likely opponent, or so it seemed at the time. Um, the critical difference there being, this is immoral, unacceptable, embarrassing, but not subject, but not the sort of crime for which one should be removed, an argument some made, others opposed. And the argument here being, if not removed, or if not constrained in some way, the likelihood that this behavior will repeat will actually impact the structural removal. In parliament, you lose when you lose a majority of your own party. In our structure, the executive should be left largely untroubled for four years until the next election, unless committing an offense so grave that it threatens the accountability mechanism of the election. So if impeachment were overused, we'd effectively have, if, it, if impeachment were used when there was lack of political support for the president, right. we would effectively have a parliamentary system. Correct. Right. And so I think there is real strength to the argument you should not overuse it. Um, and I publicly agreed with Speaker Pelosi's grave hesitation about both the partisan political value, but more importantly, the structural value of impeaching just because you really don't like the president or his policy. Um, your um, reference to the impeachment of President Clinton as well uh, brings up one of the key questions about interpreting the, the uh, language about impeachment in the Constitution, which is whether high crimes and misdemeanors have to be crimes, Correct. which is something that's been debated for a long time yes. uh, and uh, was recently debated too. Uh, what's your view on that? Um, so I was ultimately persuaded that... Um, th there's so much detail here. Let me try and be concise. Um, it cannot be the case that all statutory crimes are impeachable offenses. You, you can't, you shouldn't be removed from office for, we could list 50 garden variety, low level offenses. Catching a fish that's too large and you didn't throw it back when you were supposed to. 
not impeachable. Spoken like a law professor. <laughs> Chasing a whale, right? <laughs> I don't know if they still use that case in property, but you're not. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, right? My first week, I'm like, why am I here? What is this? Why are we chasing foxes and whales? I'm so confused. The law of Moby Dick. <laughs> um, so two things, you know, why not just say treason and bribery? Um, and there, there is, you know, obviously record of a couple of things. The phrase high crimes and misdemeanors had been in use in England for roughly 400 years, and the mechanism of judicial removal through impeachment was well known, and there was a judicial impeachment underway at the time of the framing of the Constitution. So to one line goes the argument, um, so look at what were, the, what were the bases for judicial removal through impeachment um, in Great Britain. You can weaken that line of analysis by referencing a whole lot of how it was and wasn't applied and what the standards were. Trust me, I sat through two hours of this. I'm saving you a lot of pain. Um, if you leave it to only treason and bribery, you've got offenses, and this is arguably what abuse of power is, um, that are not statutory but are structural and are eminently deserving of removal. So one of the things I think the House managers didn't do an effective job of is saying, if the president's advocates are correct, and you can only be impeached and removed for a statutory offense, then you leave out behaviors such as A, B, C, D, E. And privately, they, they shared a dozen such, and I was like, you should make that argument because there are actions the president might take that are not obviously statutory crimes, but are clearly the sorts of things for which one should be removed. Mm -hmm. um, 25th Amendment having been adopted after the framing you know, remove some of these arguments. But these are arguments about essentially demonstrable failure to do your job in a basic and ethical way. Um, I also frankly think if I were to find any grounds on which to question the House managers, dotting your I and crossing your T's, you should have just pled a specific statutory offense in addition to abuse of power. And we could have saved ourselves a whole lot of time. Um, but the component elements of extortion and bribery and how they laid up against this particular fact pattern were problematic. So am I answering your question? Yes, well? yes. Um, so, so far um, our discussion has focused on things that could go to the question about whether to impeach the president in the house or impeach a president. Um, and my next question is going to be focused on the Senate's role specifically. So, um, let's say that there are sufficient grounds to impeach and maybe sufficient grounds to remove a president. Um, do you think about the Senate's role as if there are sufficient grounds, there are necessary grounds, so the Senate is kind of duty bound if there are sufficient grounds, or is there a kind of layer of discretion about how to act on that? And if there's a layer of discretion, what kinds of things inform that discretion? That's a lovely multi-part question. <laughs> you know, the great thing about being a senator is pretty much all we do is ask other people questions that they don't really have the ability to answer. It's great to be on the receiving end for once. It's fun, I appreciate it. Great opportunity for personal growth. Um, so by way of trying to answer, one of the most shocking things I learned immediately upon being impaneled as a juror, but not really a juror, was that there is no defined standard of proof. Let me try that again for you. Anybody here been on a grand jury or a pettit jury or been in the criminal process? For whatever reason, have you been involved in the criminal justice process in a way that left you aware? <laughs> I mean, civil versus criminal, the difference between beyond a shadow of a doubt and clear and convincing and preponderance of evidence, it's a big deal. It's the difference between it's really hard to prosecute and convict you and, eh, sure, sorry. Um, apparently, this is well established that each senator is free to reach their own conclusion about what they think is the appropriate standard of proof for conviction and removal. Could have knocked me over. Um, and as several of us were opining in the run up to the actual trial, one of the things we struggled with was I'm going to be a juror, so I have to keep saying. I am keeping an open mind because I will be taking an oath to do impartial justice. How can you do impartial justice when you've already said 
under no conditions will I convict and remove this president. I think he should be removed tomorrow when you haven't even seen the evidence. And part of the answer to that is we are not actually a jury. We are both judge and jury because we are free to make individual determinations about not just kind of the standard of proof, but also the actual conduct. And the most simple proof of that was what was the first thing we did? Adopt the rules. We adopted rules for the proceedings of the trial in a way that's never done in a federal courtroom. The federal rules of criminal procedure or civil procedure are set. When you walk in and are in panels as a member of the jury, the jury doesn't vote on what the rules are gonna be. The jury doesn't vote on whether they'd like to have witnesses and evidence or not. And the jury sure as heck doesn't call up the defendant and say, hey, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> I'd like to figure out how we get you off here. Can you just give me some advice? And the prosecutor doesn't come and talk to the jury before or after and say, yeah, we really think we can get this guy, but could you make this argument? I mean, so it is, it is the analogy to an appropriate criminal process um, is not apt. And many of us in the Senate struggled to correctly articulate and engage. And one of the things I thought I was responsible for was you know, trying to help the general public understand this really odd structure. Because most people get trials and juries. And most people get that in trials you have witnesses and evidence. And few Americans get that there is a grand jury. And that in the grand jury, the defendant doesn't have a lawyer and the rules of evidence are looser, and what is developed can be produced into the trial. And so we spent a lot of time on um, due process fights over what the House did and didn't do, and whether or not the president was denied sort of basic due process and how the House conducted itself. Have I answered any yes. portion of your nope, question? No, this is great. Um, and so that, that um, leads to uh, a question about how we should think about impeachment in legal versus political terms. So, uh, Justice Story was a uh, was a wise man, and uh, as so often, he got here uh, got here before us. So, here's uh, something he said: Strictly speaking, then, the impeachment power partakes of a political character, and on this account, it requires to be guarded in its exercise against the spirit of faction, the intolerance of party, and the sudden movements of popular feeling. The prosecution will seldom fail to agitate the passions of the whole community and to divide it into parties, more or less friendly or hostile to the accused. The press, with its unsparing vigilance, will arrange itself on either side to control and influence public opinion. And there will always be some danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of the parties than by the real proofs of innocence or guilt? Is it inescapably political as well as legal? Or should we try to make it more political and less legal or more legal and less political? My personal view is we would benefit from making it more legal and less political. One of the discussions I had with colleagues during and after is, could we not improve this process by coming to some set of agreements about subpoenas, about witnesses, about burdens of proof, about, because bluntly, for all of us, if you take a step back and look at it, what we have simply succeeded in doing, or what is a, I think, undeniable outcome of this proceeding is the combination of the inflaming of partisan passions and faction and the denigration of the popular view of the Senate as a place where anything constructive happens. Um, I'm having that same conversation with the same parties as I did after Kavanaugh. And we have a, a distinct but similar set of um, issues and concerns here. Um, the more the Senate and its role um, is both seen as and is believed to be and is believable to be purely partisan, um, the less I think we perform any of our intended function. Um, the saucer Great. hot tea metaphor. Um, Thank you, James Madison. Who continues to provide with all sorts of gifts. Um, but at the end of the day, um, impeachment should be rare, should be a break the glass moment, and should be something that can actually draw um, bipartisan support. And one of the more telling arguments made by the president's defenders was we shouldn't be here, we shouldn't be proceeding, because if one party 
could not get a single vote of the other party for articles of impeachment, that should have been the clear sign that we shouldn't proceed. To which the rejoinder was, no, that's the clear sign that one party is no longer taking their constitutional, congressional responsibility seriously. Either way, it was a clear warning sign that we were not heading into good territory. Right. Um, a lot of people in this room probably watched a substantial portion of the trial or watched. I, I would hate to ask for a show of hands because my <laughs> hunch is most of you were busy doing other things with your life and you're here just to find out what you missed. <laughs> Could be, but one thing everybody in the room missed is whatever the conversations were behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, so uh, without betraying any confidences, um, what was that like for uh, your interactions with uh, senators in your party, senators of the opposite party, um, what the public didn't see during the trial? Um, I will say to my, to my regret and disappointment, it was the most partisan period I've had in 10 years. Um, I enjoy actual friendships with more than a dozen Republican senators who, I mean, I'm more likely to get a happy birthday text or a um, how are you kids doing or great job on TV from these dozen Republicans than from most of my Democratic colleagues, something for which I'm criticized by some in my caucus. I think it's my job to figure out how to really work with people. Um, Senator Braun of Indiana um, defeated my good friend Joe Donnelly. Um, you know, this isn't ex-girlfriend time. You know, it's okay for me to work with him. We've ended up really working well together on some big issues, climate change being one of them. Um, so that's just a, hey, trust me, I actually know Republicans. Um, this two-week period saw more running to our corners and refusing to even talk to each other than any two weeks I've seen. I had more unreturned emails and calls. I had one particularly prominent Republican abruptly cancel dinner with me just saying, I just can't be seen publicly talking to you. You know, trust me, I'll get to the decision that is right for my faith, for the country, but stop, like, just stop. And there was a distinct, there, it was a period where it was quite difficult. Despite that, I had a number of uh, long and heartfelt late night conversations. Um, and one of the things that was striking, I'll just take you into our cloakroom for a minute. So there's a number of very um, um, accomplished prosecutors um, in my caucus and the other. Um, one of the most common ways to end up in the Senate is to be a former attorney general. One of the most likely ways to be an attorney general is to be a prominent and successful prosecutor. Um, so after every sort of two, three hours, realize we were doing this eight to 10 hours at a stretch, day after day after day after day. And there's actually still a few dozen senators who aren't lawyers. Shocking, I know. Um, terrible, terrible. But we, <laughs> so we'd recede into our cloakrooms where there was coffee, which was desperately needed, junk food, which wasn't needed but was helpful. Um, and folks would be like, hang on a minute. His argument on this about the rules of the House and subpoenas and committees, isn't it actually the case that the rules changed on this date? And so what he was saying was clever. It's accurate, but he's citing the Johnson precedent because they had to have an, blah, blah, blah. And a group of us, and I'm not the experienced prosecutor, would say, yeah, 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 you're right, but go look at this page in their brief. For the true nerds in the room, like Doug Jones. Doug Jones, real honest to goodness prosecutor. Um, you know, We've got a number of folks, US attorneys, attorneys general, who were taking notes, following everything, reading the briefs, and we typically would sort of put our heads together in the break and then argue what point would have actually been more persuasive where's the weakness where's the strength others in our caucus like having been separated from their digital lifeline for several hours would grasp them like a drowning or actually man in the desert and like race to the brief respite we were separated from our cell phones for the entire trial my staff was terrified how will you possibly make it, they kept saying. I said, you know, I lived my entire life in college and law school before these things were invented. They were even more worried. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think one of the striking things was um, the extent to which we were not constructively talking. 
We didn't seriously explore bipartisan questions. There were two asked. There should have been 10. Um, we didn't seriously try, well, I tried, we didn't succeed in having a working group that negotiated a resolution about witnesses and, and evidence, which did happen during the Clinton trial. We never went to the old Senate chamber for a, hey, nobody in the room except us, let's talk, which happened in the Clinton trial, and we all expected would happen here, but didn't. A piece of what set us on the course we were on was, forgive me, but McConnell and Schumer talking past each other for weeks. McConnell saying, I'm going to put forward a resolution that frames the rules of the trial that's just like Clinton, and then airdropping it, I mean, the night before we voted on it, a set of rules that was not that, and then it being adopted on a straight party line vote. From the very outset, there was a sense of, we know how this ends, we know how it's being run, and we all just gotta get through two weeks of this and we're done. And that gave it a certain heaviness, a certain grimness. Mm -hmm. And other than a handful of us, most members of both parties were like, I know how this ends. So I'll listen to the arguments, I'll go on TV, and I'll go home. That I thought was our single greatest failing because we did have an opportunity to show what it would mean to take the trial seriously and what it would mean if people of each party voted the other way. We didn't really do that. Now, you are a person of faith and in your statement in the Senate explaining your vote, you concluded with a uh, quotation from a lovely prayer from the uh, Senate chaplain. Uh, does that perspective inform like how you went through the process or how you think about your, your public role and duties? Um, yes, and I like to believe, I, I hope that it does with all of us. Um, one of the things I most admire about Chaplain Black, um, he, uh, he's an admiral, he was the head of all Navy chaplains before becoming the Senate chaplain. Um, and he has a unique and a special and a very difficult role. Um, he, uh, he helps us every week in our bipartisan prayer break breakfast. He meets with any of us who want to individually, but he also opens, he opened the Senate in prayer every morning of the impeachment trial. Um, and if you go back and read them, um, he worked very hard, I am convinced, to craft prayers that um, did not speak to or confirm the assumptions or worldview of either party, but instead just try to sort of challenge us and push us and call us to humility and to being attentive to what our higher calling is. Um, some of us tried to frame um, our work and our reflections um, in that context and others you know, bluntly would just openly dismiss it. So one of the things that was a challenge to me was that as we filed into the chamber and then you know, said the Pledge of Allegiance, we got sworn in, said the Pledge of Allegiance, and the chaplain would open with us with prayer, you could see some members were really um, moved by it, challenged by it, and others were just you know, taking notes and moving the pencils around. Um, more than anything, I was conscious of um, the need for forgiveness, the importance of humility, um, the significance of the moment, and my desperation at the sense of a lack of pathways and options. So. Now, a question that goes beyond um, impeachment, um, a broader question that I know is, is uh, of great concern to you. How concerned should we be about election security and um, foreign interference in US elections? A lot. Um, um, so first, um, this was something that was of great concern to the founders um, for good reason. Um, the United States was a weak, young power um, and um, the great powers of Europe were um, quite capable of significantly interfering in the political affairs of other countries in the world. And I mean, obviously we won our revolution uh, against Great Britain, literally by inviting military intervention by the French. So, you know, this wasn't hypothetical to them. Um, and in the first couple of years, the first few elections, um, there were occasional scandals about alleged either British or French interference in our elections. Um, and 
this was the key issue in the impeachment trial. Um, and I would argue um, there's news literally this week that confirmed what my law school classmate, Chris Ray, um, director of the FBI, has testified to the Senate, um, what former Indiana Senator Dan Coats, um, the immediate past director of national intelligence testified. These are both lifelong Republicans chosen by Trump. They testified um, in front of the Judiciary Committee that Russia was, is, and will be seeking to interfere in our 2020 elections. They have been joined by very capable cyber actors um, from North Korea, Iran, China, and um, Dan, former Senator Coates, literally said the 2020 election will be the Super Bowl of cyber interference. Um, a brief, optimistic, I hope bipartisan moment, election security comes through the Appropriations Subcommittee where I'm the ranking Democrat. Um, James Langford and I were able to get 380 million for election security two years ago. Um, in my small home state of Delaware, that helped contribute to buying completely new election equipment because ours was 20 years old, was among the worst in the country, eminently hackable. Um, a 14 year old succeeded in hacking um, our election machinery in 15 minutes at a Homeland Security sponsored hackathon. Um, <laughs> just think wow. about that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we're literally talking about a machinery that is less sophisticated than those little Pokemon uh, things uh, some of you may know from adolescence. Um, I mean, who has a 20? These election machines were 20 years old. Does anyone here have a 20 year old cell phone? Of course not. They didn't exist in this form. They were flip phones. Schumer and Graham use them every day. <laughs> but um, so A, B, um, just a few months ago, um, Senator McConnell and I actually worked together to get another round of 425 million in election security grants. That should be modestly encouraging. And Homeland Security and the NSA and others are very aware of the threat and very engaged. In it. And um, Senator Burr, who's chairman of Intel, has tried repeatedly to reassure me uh, we've got this all under hand. On the other hand, there are three bipartisan bills that would provide some of the legal framework and some of the uh, proactive sanctions to deter Russia um, and some ways to provide transparency and accountability, particularly for social media, um, that have been blocked that are ready for a vote on the floor of the Senate, or one of the last things we did the Thursday before we left was three different senators called them up, asked for unanimous consent, and they were blocked. I don't understand why we're not passing critically needed legislation to further strengthen these results. If anybody paid attention to what happened in the Iowa caucuses, it was a complete mess. And imagine if who is our next president hangs in the balance of the wreckage of three different states where we are actively litigating what happened, was it hacked, was it not, by whom, how do we know? And we have weeks of an inconclusive, indecisive result. Seems like a nightmare scenario. Some would argue that the hanging chads of Florida and Bush v. Gore and the 2000 election was a near miss, where frankly the fact that the losing candidate ultimately said, you know, I respect the judgment of the Supreme Court, rather than doing what happens in a dozen other countries around the world every year and going to the streets and calling for protests and seeking uh, to overturn the elections or to recognize the real results of the elections, depending on your outcome. This is a very real threat facing our country. Legitimacy is a fundamental issue. The legitimacy of the Supreme Court, the legitimacy of our, legitimacy of our federal courts, respect for the rule of law, and the fact that we have never had a failed federal election, although we came darn close twice, should make this the one thing that unifies all of us. I am concerned that it's not. I'm very sympathetic on the uh, importance of election security. I, uh, I wanna ask you a tough question. It's one that I, I don't mean as a gotcha question. Um, this is but, a long lead up to the pitch. But, uh, but it's, I mean, part of what we do in law school is we take a principle and we like look for the, like how far can we carry it? Like logical extensions. So um, um, 
It's sometimes been the case, rumor has it, that the United States has, uh, let me avoid the word interfered with, involved itself in elections in other countries. Yes. Um, is that something that should be verboten for yes. us? Yes. Or is there, should there be an asymmetry? No. Um, um, I mean, I, I frankly think um, there are a half dozen countries in the world where our interference in their election, Iran, Guatemala, Chile, is known by virtually every person in the country. It is the very first thing they throw in your face when you talk to them about human rights, rule of law, fair elections, and it isn't just those. There's a dozen more, and most of the world's well aware of it. And at the end of the day, if we mean free speech, freedom of conscience, rule of law, fair elections, um, being a party to inappropriately determining, not just interfering with, let's be blunt, determining or overturning free and fair elections is something we should not do. So uh, I'd like to transition now to some questions that have been received, submitted in advance from the audience, and then we can also, if uh, we have time, take some uh, live. Um, so one question is, uh, will impeachment now, based on the uh, impeachment but non-conviction of President Trump, um, should, uh, do, do you expect that impeachment is going to become more common or is it going to become less common? And either way, is that a good result? Um, so, you know, sort of the good news, bad news here, I think, is that um, for most of my generation, um, the Watergate process was sort of um, the platonic ideal of how um, a slowly building but gradually clear bipartisan consensus results in um, the threat and removal of the president. The president respects uh, the orders of the Supreme Court, even though it almost certainly spells his political demise. And then once told that the votes just aren't there, you know, resigns in peace and leaves. Um, and the Clinton impeachment, you know, two decades roughly later, was held up as, depending on your worldview, the failure to hold accountable an immoral president or an overly partisan impeachment. This one just kind of goes further in that line, where depending on your worldview, you're either saying abject failure of political accountability by one party or utter partisan, you know, witch hunt, hoax, fill in the blank. Um, my gut hunch is that the outcome of this trial um, will result in it being a long time uh, before a majority of one party tries to use impeachment to remove a president of the other party. And um, my hope, because I try to be hopeful, um, is that the handful of senators who will be around the next time this happens will say, hang on a minute, what are you, what are you doing? What are you thinking? If you can't at the outset of this process have at least three voices from the other party that say, this is gravely concerning, we are considering removal, don't stop. And that raises a larger problem about sort of the sharpness of the division in our parties. I am gravely concerned that this trial has weakened congressional power of oversight, has made it less likely that congressional subpoenas will be respected or enforced, and has made it less likely that impeachment functions um, in the future because the partisan lesson is you shot and you missed, didn't work, weakened the party. That's at least, you know, I think a clear eyed review from my partisan perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the view from the other party may well be some of the most partisan have said, wait till your guy gets in next. We're going to impeach him in the first month just so you get a taste of payback. And I think the broader majority will say, the lesson learned here is this is a mess. It is not a means of effective accountability. Which has serious um, repercussions for impeachment as a structural check on the presidency. Correct. It is dramatically weakened, I would argue. Right. Um, a number of the questions uh, received were um, what you could call um, strategic failure questions. In other words, was this, uh, was this result ultimately inevitable from the beginning, or were there things that could have been done by the Democratic majority in the House 
let's say, that might have been different. So some of the questions were asked, uh, for example, did talking too early and too much about impeachment poison the well? Um, should there have been uh, not a push to get through by Christmas, but instead uh, more witnesses and more evidence gathering in the House? Um, should there have been a move to try to go to the courts to get subpoenas? Um, um, so all of those can be wrapped up in, um, was the result predestined or was there a, like a, a, a different way to get there that would have led to something different? Right. So that's, um, that's kind of one of the questions. Um, partly why many of you didn't watch it uh, in great detail, partly why many of my colleagues were in the cloakroom or napping during some of the critical arguments was that we all believed we knew the outcome the day it started. And that had a, a dispiriting or, or leadening impact. Um, I think Speaker Pelosi, um, who is whatever you think of her, I think a very able, very agile um, caucus leader who has a very disparate caucus with a very wide range of views. Um, she was fending off impeachment for months, arguably years. Um, and only when a group of seven of the most moderate and vulnerable um, uh, swing state uh, first term Democratic Congress members who had experience in national security. This is a group of veterans of the CIA, the Army, the Air Force. I'm close to several of them because we share sort of similar politics. I was surprised. They wrote an editorial saying we must begin impeachment now after the uh, whistleblower. Um, you know, should they have gone to the courts? Uh, I think it would have given them an a better point of argument. Um, should they have developed more witnesses? Um, I am stunned at how many witnesses they got and how much they testified to. I'll say this, it was clear to me, many of my colleagues were seeing this evidence for the first time um, once we got into the trial. But to be fair to all of us, we're busy. We have hearings, we have meetings, we have speeches, we run all over the place. Um, I had missed half of the witnesses in the House. So how you responded to that varied, but um, it was striking to me that you had more than a dozen relatively senior ambassadors, National Security Council, uh, career folks testify in the face of a direct order not to at the clear risk of their careers. And in several cases with really fairly compelling evidence. Um, so. Should they have developed more evidence? They got to a point where they're like, this is more than enough if it's a fair trial. What I wrestle with was the decision, I think, not to characterize, but on the part of House leadership was, we don't think this is going to be a fair trial in any case. So we're pitching it over to the Senate and good luck. And we could get 10 more witnesses. We could spend three more months, but it's not going to have any impact on the outcome. So we might as well move it over to you to which I was tempted to say, why are you sending that? Why are you sending it to us? Give us a month to try and get a, a censure motion going and don't be so bent on uh, getting it over to us. The disconnections between the House and the Senate, the Republican and the, and the Democratic caucuses in some part led to that because we weren't talking to each other um, unless conversations were happening I didn't know anything about. And if this were the Senate of 1974, you would have had a group that sat down and said, hang on a minute, what's in the best interest of the country? One of the most compelling conversations I ever had with a senator who's now passed, but I'm, I'm not gonna use his name, was about Iran-Contra and when a very similar moment happened. And a group of, a bipartisan group of senior senators sat down with each other and said, President Reagan has clearly committed a crime. He has, he's broken the law. And it's clear, but we are not going to proceed with impeachment because it's just not, it is incredibly destructive, it's divisive, it's distracting. He will not come out well, the country will not come out well. We, we, we need to stop. And there isn't as much public debate about that moment as I think there should be. Right. And I know there's very strong feelings on both sides and I don't mean to discount some of the other arguments, but, um, would your view of President Reagan be any different if he'd been impeached? Um, I don't know. 
Um, is anyone surprised with what I just said? Congress passed a law. He knowingly violated it. That's called breaking the law. Um, but there was more than enough accountability in terms of his most senior people, almost all of whom were subsequently pardoned. Um, the country had been through a lot, and we were in this moment of contest with the Soviet Union where there was a bipartisan sense of weakening the president is the wrong thing to do now. That belongs in the impeachment canon. Otherwise, you have a kind of selection bias of just the other exactly. cases. Right. Um, so uh, questions from the floor, and I th will threaten you, if you don't ask questions, I will ask about Andrew Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fascinating case, by the way. <sighs> you say Alan Dershowitz, and you get this like existential sigh out of the end. <laughs> please. Corruption. Um, excellent point. Um, you know, that, that did cross my mind as they were making the arguments that there were moments, and, and like, this is not meant to be disrespectful to the House managers, who generally I thought did an outstanding job with a very challenging environment and a tough jury. <laughs> um, but that was one point where I thought at a couple of moments there was just too much of what I would call pitching the MSNBC jury, which is sloppy assumptions that of course, you, of course you know President Trump's not really interested in fighting corruption. What do you mean? I don't know that. Prove it. Put the facts out. Argue it in detail. Compel me. Don't just assert. Prove. And that was one where I felt like they kind of, you know, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Just sort of glissed over it. And, and I'm sitting here going, there's evidence. It, I, I mean, I'm involved in a lot of work in the Foreign Relations Committee and the Appropriations Committee in the developing world. There was evidence that could have been presented that didn't require subpoenas, didn't require deep analysis, just required a little bit more work. Um, and that was one I did think they just sort of glissed over. And for better or worse, you come into that room with assumptions about Giuliani, his background, his priorities, his values, his motivation. And when you're the prosecutor, um, you have to work with a jury who've got prejudices and preconceptions, and you can't just throw out the name Giuliani as if everybody in the room thinks he's a corrupt fool and expect that to work. That's not, that's not good prosecuting. You need to sort of lay the predicate, walk through the details, explain. Obviously, one of the things that made this a, an interesting environment was that there were breaking stories about both Lev Parnas um, and um, the book by John Bolton literally while we're in the trial. We were the farthest thing from a sequestered jury. Um, we were except for the cell phones. Except for the cell phones. <laughs> but I mean, every second hour when we had a break, folks were like, so I, I do think focusing on the case, making it particular on that point, um, would have strengthened their hand. One of the big takeaways I get from everything you just said is the underlying sadness yeah. of the state of polarization. Sorry, but yes. <laughs> Deeply. The functioning of politics in our country, and this is just a moment of you know, my lawyer and It sounds like maybe we're getting to the point where it becomes this dangerous to the public. Is there anything yes. that can be done to reverse this and to repair functioning across party lines of the government? Vote. I think I said this before. I've certainly said it in many other contexts. I think I said this the last time I was here. Um, I do a lot of um, interacting with um, advocates, donors, interest groups. Um, I'm in my own reelection. Lots of my colleagues are up for reelection. There is this other thing going on between the president and other people. I'm not supposed to talk too much about elections. 
but I'll simply say the only functional accountability mechanism left is the election. And what I say to lots of people is, thank you for your support. <laughs> if you're supporting candidates of either side, Republican or Democrat, for the Senate, ask them a simple question. Name three members of the other party who you are actually friends with. What's their spouse's name? What are their kids' names? Have you been to their house? Have you traveled together? Tell me three bills that you're sponsoring that your party isn't that wild about, that's pushing the boundary, that's actually a little sacrificial, that's building trust with the other party by getting out of your comfort zone. And tell me when you've cast a vote that upset or disappointed some of your core constituencies or those who've supported you for election. Because if they can't answer those three questions, then they're not capable of being part of the solution. If our house is on fire and you keep hiring arsonists, don't be surprised the fire's getting worse. If the house is on fire and you wanna hire some firefighters, that's great, but they have to be actually able to hear the other side's argument and occasionally, in even the smallest ways, risk reaching. And after that, we need some carpenters. So at the end of the day, no disrespect, this comes down to whether our electorate is able, the electorate of Estonia was on the receiving end of a remarkable social media disinformation influence campaign by Russia, yet managed to see truth versus influence. The American people have to be capable of discerning what sorts of people they should elect if they actually want their problem solved and what sort of national government they want if they want us to work together. And I don't know what other states my colleagues come from. I'm stunned by some of the things they say and do. In my state, the most partisan Democrats say to me, it's great you work across the aisle. You all need to do more of that because without compromise, we can't find solutions. So I think that wisdom is broadly distributed. And I hope that the result will be the election of more people actually willing to work across the aisle. But there are days I am not hopeful. And the actual, the actual, like you could feel it in the room that the, you know, we talk about the aisle, there's literally an aisle in the Senate chamber. I've never felt it so sharply where, you know, when the chief justice and then the majority leader would say, we're in recess, everybody literally leapt up and went to their corners. And the few moments when there was any sort of chatting or mixing afterwards, I was hanging on to like a life raft. And occasionally we'd, we'd literally just talk about, you know, what, do you have, what, do you, what did you have for lunch? Just so that the press and people on television would see some conversation. But yes, I, there is a deep sadness and a grave worry. And I, I am really concerned about our republic because if you demonize the other party and describe them as maniacs and crazy, right, then it's pretty hard to work with them. Um, and there's an awful lot of that these days. And I don't think it's helpful or constructive. Returning to your discussion about Betsy's office and perhaps the lack of thought. <laughs> So um, the very last vote we took the first night uh, was a suggestion by Chris Van Hollen of Maryland um, that in the course of the week, as I talked to some of my Republican colleagues, I realized it, it hadn't been socialized enough and folks didn't realize exactly what they were voting on. It was a vote to empower the Chief Justice to make a ruling on the admissibility of witnesses and evidence, which was on the part of the Democratic minority, right? Kind of a, hey, who knows? How's this gonna go? And Chris, Senator Van Hollen, meant it as a, I don't know, what do you think? He's kind of more your guy than ours, but let's trust that he's a, I don't know, judge, maybe even a chief justice. And if we get to a close call on witnesses or evidence, having him decide the jump balls is probably a good thing. There was some precedent for it. Um, there were two moments in the Johnson trial where the Chief Justice made a ruling, and then immediately afterwards, an actual vote by the Senate 
to strip the Chief Justice of the power to do so, which failed, thus affirming implicitly. And nobody knew how it was going to turn out. That was the one actual vote that was meant as a, hey, what do you think? And it died on a straight party line vote. But it was one o'clock in the morning. We've been there for 12 hours. My Republican colleagues were paying no attention at that point. They just assumed this was Schumer had teed up, you know, whatever, six votes in a row, and they're like, yeah, whatever. So in the course of the week, I kept urging Senator Van Hollen to go in the other cloakroom and talk it up and explain what you're doing. And by the time we got to a reconsideration of it, um, there'd been enough public announcements of the few who might have been open to it um, that it, it wasn't seriously considered at the far end. Am I answering your question at all? Um, the critical due process issues really were in the House process before it came to us. And you know, by the time we're an impaneled semi-jury, that's really water under the bridge. But had the House Judiciary Committee um, taken a little more time, um, I, I think some of the more compelling arguments that the President's advocates had would have been weaker. Because we, because we started at 2.08, I'm going to take time for one more question to give us a, the full hour. Yes. Thank you, Senator. I've watched it on TV and I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and in person. <laughs> I'm shorter in person. Uh, I want to pick up on the previous question about connections between uh, last remedy. So what happens when the elections become um, most people we know, they don't, like Timo was mentioned in this forum, they don't have time to do other things, they don't have time to really absorb the arguments and deliberate. And they're getting information about candidates from, uh, you know, in, inter interest groups who shape public opinion on highly polarized media and in social media feeds. So our, I feel like our election you know, process has, has, has failed us. And now that we have, um, you know, even for a medley, it adds another dimension. And then the prospect of um, those who are competing for these elections not respecting the rule of law and proceeding, leading to all kinds of civil unrest that unrest that we imagine in a terrible country, is really um, scary. So, is election, are elections really to find a remedy, or does there need to be something to reform that whole process? Um, of course, thank you for your question. Um, I, I am struggling with deep anxiety uh, about this. I've been to several dozen countries um, that have regular elections, that have admirable constitutions, but do not have real rule of law and do not have free and fair elections. And um, I think democracy um, is a fragile thing. And at times, um, the, the capacity of the average citizen to stand up and fight for it and force it and, and insist on it and sustain it is the only thing that gives me any courage. Um, I'll say this, President Zelensky of Ukraine, who played an entirely undesired on his part but fairly leading role in this whole drama, um, just met with a bipartisan group of senators last week, all of whom came back and said, he is the real deal. This is a guy who actually is, like, fighting for a better country and trying to like claw Ukraine out of being one of the most corrupt places on earth a while ago, he would insist I say. Um, there are people around the world who recognize how hard it is to sustain rule of law, to sustain free and fair elections, to, to get to a place where like you have a voice. I literally work for you, not the other way around. Um, I only hope that the American people grasp what a big deal this is um, before it's too late. Should there be reforms to our election system was your close? Absolutely. Citizens United was one of the most disastrous moves uh, caused by the court in, in our lifetimes. And the ways in which having entirely non-transparent, entirely unaccountable, massive pools of funding that can drop in out of the sky and swing an election in a district or a state at the last minute or for the presidential. I mean, it's truly toxic. Um, look, there's always been money in politics in the United States and around the world, but no other country has it with quite the unbridled uh, ferocity today. 
A, B. I could talk at great length about the increasingly sharp and offensive tools for voter suppression that are being deployed around the country. Uh, since Shelby County really eviscerated the guts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, but frankly, above both of those rises the monstrous indifference of roughly half the American people who say, eh, doesn't matter, won't affect my life. You're all just a bunch of corrupt fools. Um, I only get angry at people who tell me I don't vote. And when I say why, occasionally they say felon, but when I say why, <laughs> Truly one of my most memorable, I'm going door to door for a, when I was a second year law student, I went to North Carolina for Harvey Gantt. It was one of my most memorable moments. I knock on a door and this guy looks at me, tears the door open, he's naked to the waist and has a motorcycle in the living room and he says, you hear about voting? And I said, yes. And he said, can't, sell it, ha, slim. And I went, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll just leave the brochure right here. <laughs> when people tell me they can vote, but they don't, because they don't think it matters. Like, vote for my opponent, go right ahead. I mean, I'd rather you not. Can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> but, like, don't tell me it doesn't matter, because it has huge consequences. So, the rest of the world watches far more closely what we do than I think any, anyone who hasn't lived outside the country realizes. We project and we have echoes and, and we have ways that our politics and our conduct strongly influences positively and negatively lots of other countries on Earth. And um, the idea that half of the American people can't be bothered and that we have well-funded and designed structures that are increasingly making it harder and harder to find a place to vote and to get to vote. And we have all sorts of shenanigans in terms of registration and hours and that, frankly, we now have unleashed massive um, financial forces, and that we now have foreign interference, all of that should give you pause. Let me close with a quick story. So I'm from a small state. The very first time I ran for election. So uh, it's 2000. Uh, I have infant twins. Uh, my wife's pregnant. I have a full-time job as a lawyer for a big company. And I am barely keeping my head above water. I am trying to get to all these events. I'm running to represent half a million people, and I have one campaign staffer. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm just barely making it. And I go to Corpus Christi in Ellesmere. Uh, it's their church fest. We have a season where every parish has their festival. And it's a great chance to just kind of walk around and meet people and say hi. And I get there late because I've just gotten from work and I've gone home. I've gotten one of my boys. I'm there. And I've got my big button, hi, I'm Chris Coons, I'm running for county council president. And one person who's got like little brochures. And this squall comes racing through, like I can see, like the whole festival's about to get shut down by a driving rain. And I'm like, hi, hi, I'd like to meet, hi, I'm running for office. And this woman who's got four little kids behind her is like racing and she stops. She grabs my hand, she pulls me in, she looks me right in the eyes, she goes, who are you? I said, I'm Chris Coons. She goes, what are you running for? I said, county council president. She goes, uh-huh. Looks at my hand. She goes, you work? I said, I work hard, ma'am. She goes, you work with your hands. I said, no, ma'am, I'm actually, I'm actually a lawyer. She goes, huh, you love your wife? I said, I adore her. She said, you gonna work for me? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, can I give you how to reach me? Can I, do, can I give you, she's still holding my hand. <laughs> can I give you my cell phone? She goes, will you answer when I call? I said, as God is my witness. She looked at me, she goes, you just earned my vote, mister, through my hand. That's what makes me believe the American people are capable of seeing right through us and making decisions about our character that, that are pretty telling. And like that, sometimes, sometimes, they make the right decision. Let's thank Senator Coons for being here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.